Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth day of RIA's Unlocking Innovation event on light rail and low-cost railway. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today, whether you've, this is your first day or whether you've been to the last two or three days. The Unlocking Innovation events are the result of collaboration between us in the Rail Industry Association, uh, Network Rail, and the UK Rail Research and Innovation Network, uh, otherwise known as Ukraine, and uh, I thank them for their continued support with these events. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, mine, or have been attending the previous days, my name's Carl King. I'm one of the technical and innovation managers at RIA, and I'll be sharing today's event. Uh, following on from the last three days, we're going to be talking about the wider uh, Very Right Rail, Rail system today. And we've got some great presenters again, uh, including from organisations such as the Black Con uh, Con Country Innovative Manufacturing Organisation, and uh, University of Warwick, and also uh, Westfield Cars as well. Very exciting. We're going to finish off with some uh, elevator as usual. We'll have three main presentations and uh, two five minute elevator pitches. Just to go through a few things, uh, we'll hopefully finish after those have been finished, we'll finish with a panel QA session as always. And you can send questions in the uh, question facility in the questions tab. Uh, uh, please uh, do. Uh, send any that you have for people as the uh, event goes on and uh, I'll pick up the common themes and uh, be and, and send putting the questions to the presenters at the session at the end just let everyone know that this event is being recorded and uh, for those of you anyone who's interested the presentations from today's from all the day's events that have been done so far are available in the handouts section of the um, of the go to panel so if you go to go the go drop down box for handouts you'll be able to find all the pdfs of all the presentations there all of this main program we're hoping to get finished by 3 30 but we are then going to have like last three days a 30 minute uh, zoom call after that which you're all welcome to attend and uh, we will be setting up some uh, breakout rooms in there so you can have anyone who wants to have some more in-depth discussion with any of the speakers today can do so um I'm hope one of my colleagues is hopefully going to just put the link to the Zoom in the chat now. Uh, please, though, do not, uh, and it'll also be put up again just before we uh, finish. For, before we finish, but well, please ask you not to click on that link until um, we are ready to open. Because if we click on it before we have opened the Zoom room, uh, it will ask you for a password which you don't need. Once we will let you know when that is ready, and then when you click on that, you'll just get straight into the Zoom room. Right, well, uh, we'll get straight on with it. Thank you, and again, like I say, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, to start with, our first speaker is Dr. Nick Mallinson, who's the CEO of Black County Innovative Manufacturing Organization. And he's going to give us a brief introduction to the BCIMO and his role in overseeing the construction and subsequent operation of the Very Light Rail National Innovation Center that's in Dudley. So Neil, if you uh, sorry, so Nick, if you could just put your camera on, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Carl. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as um, Carl said, I'm Nick Mallinson. I'm the chief executive of uh, the Black Country Innovative Manufacturing Organisation, or BCIMO, as we uh, call ourselves. And I'm going to spend the next um, 15 minutes or so, giving you a brief overview of uh, the new centre and what we're hoping to achieve with it. Oops, sorry about that. Right, so um, there have been uh, quite a few uh, proposals for very light rail or ultra light rail solutions uh, over recent years. Um, most of them characterized by a lack of common approaches. Um, but more recently, uh, I think we've started to bring a little bit more order into the um, possibilities of very light rail. In 2014, uh, WMG and uh, a number of commercial partners decided to work together uh, on the development of a very light rail uh, vehicle, a rail car called Revolution. Um, subsequently, uh, Coventry City Council asked if the same principles could be applied to a tram, and that led to the Coventry Very Light Rail Shuttle Program. Um, and those two projects really uh, have helped to 
uh, make the case for there being an innovation centre to support the development of this technology further and hopefully the development of a UK industry. <clears throat> so if we just look at the two vehicles I've mentioned very briefly, the Revolution Very Light Rail um, rail car, which I was involved in when I worked at uh, WMG. Uh, this is a consortium led by Transport Design International. Um, it's a, a very lightweight vehicle weighing around about 20 tonnes. Uh, it has a diesel electric battery hybrid propulsion system and uh, it was designed essentially to operate on reopened uh, branch lines, maybe some of the beaching reversal lines, uh, new lines and on some existing branch lines where the cost of using traditional vehicles uh, was making it difficult for them to be uh, cost effective. This vehicle uh, is coming towards the end of its construction at the Quinton Rail Technology Centre. Uh, I believe we're expecting it to be rolled out in around about March 2021. And if you are uh, interested in more details on this, please visit the website revolutionvlr.com. The Coventry Very Light Rail Shuttle. This is a project led by Coventry City uh, and to develop, and this is to develop a low cost battery powered very light rail car, uh, essentially for use in the city centre. Um, the demonstrator is currently under construction at NP Aerospace in Coventry. Uh, it will be completed in uh, this month, just before Christmas, um, and testing will begin at the new innovation center that I'm gonna tell you a bit more about in a moment in uh, early 2021. And Coventry City Council have some very ambitious plans to open the first route in Coventry using this vehicle and a novel track solution uh, by 2024. And again, you can find out more about that at the website shown on this slide. So what's missing? Um, cities and regional transport bodies um, are not system integrators or engineering organisations. They know what they would like, but they're not really, uh, they don't possess the skills to make it happen. Um, and this often leads to problems uh, on projects uh, where they overrun, both in cost and time scales, and they don't sometimes deliver what was expected. You can categorize that in effect as a market failure because what the customers really want to buy is a proven off the shelf, low risk, low risk system. And that is not currently available. Most schemes are very bespoke. So we are all about trying to change this. So I asked the question, what if, sorry about the IT hit, what if there was a way to develop integrate and prove very light rail systems from components through to finished systems. Uh, a place to do this work so that each customer does not have to suffer uh, the development cycles that are typical these days, a hub where customers can work together and share best practice, and a place where suppliers can work to develop their ideas and products. Well, we are building this place. Uh, the BCIMO is the holding company created to oversee the, the build, the launch and operation of a new very light rail national innovation centre to be built in Dudley. And these are some of the very important funders and partners that I personally have worked with over the last uh, five years to bring this centre uh, to fruition. So uh, we're very grateful to receive some uh, European funding. Uh, we've got support from the Midlands Engine. Dudley Council have moved heaven and earth uh, in raising £28 million for the centre. Uh, there's been a lot of support from WMG, from Coventry City Council. And uh, 
going more widely, uh, Eversholt Rail, uh, one of the existing Roscoe companies, uh, is very supportive of this initiative. So you can see on, apologies, the computer keeps going two instead of one. Um, so you can see on this slide, uh, the architects um, rendered drawing of what the innovation center will look like when its construction uh, is completed uh, in the first quarter of 2022. The foundations are currently being um, developed um, and uh, the whole area around there is basically a mass of mud at the moment, but um, it will um, include a triple height engineering hall uh, with overhead gantry train. There'll be a number of research laboratories looking at uh, specific problems such as lightweight structures. Um, there'll be a test track uh, which will enable the evaluation of both prototype vehicles, control systems, and the space to put down uh, prototype track solutions. Uh, there'll be some meeting rooms and a conference and exhibition area. And there'll be about 45 people in the centre and some accommodation for small and medium sized businesses. The, the actual centre is about 4,600 square metres. And um, as I say, uh, construction is currently underway. I mentioned the uh, test track. This runs for 2.2 kilometres on what was the old uh, South Staffordshire Railway, which closed uh, in the 1980s when freight operations were, were uh, ceased. Um, there is actually an 800 metre section of the test track uh, running through a tunnel, and you can see on, on the screen uh, a view down the tunnel. Um, it's not usually lit because there is a family of bats that live in the tunnel and um, we have to make sure we don't disturb the bats. But um, the, um, the track is now being extended at the end close to the Innovation Centre with a very special 15 metre radius loop to enable uh, cornering trials on the Coventry Very Light Rail shuttle. It, uh, it may have to negotiate some very tight turns in the middle of Coventry. The test track actually is very close to completion um, and uh, we get it handed over to us in January of 2021. And in fact, we then expect the Coventry shuttle vehicle to arrive at the end of January, ready for several months of testing. So, um, what technology areas do we hope to support? Well, this um, diagram is intended really to emphasize that we're very keen on system integration as our focus. That will include some work on vehicles, on civil uh, and, and uh, track infrastructure, uh, some work around command and control, and uh, also some passenger experience uh, and that's not just uh, to do with vehicles, it's to do with the halts that people may um, be waiting for a vehicle to come. Um, and of course, we've got to deal with things like COVID and, and whether social distancing becomes a permanent feature of our lives. But all of this is really based, I think, very heavily now on digital technologies, um, both within the vehicle and especially in the command and control. Um, there is a very novel uh, track form already under development as part of the Coventry Very Light Rail System. Uh, that work is being led by WMG. And um, we will actually be incorporating that novel track into the 15 meter loop uh, section of the, of, uh, of the main test track uh, to enable that track form to be tested as a system with the Coventry Very Light Rail uh, shuttle. This will happen. Um, towards the end of next year. Um, we're also talking with partners um, about uh, looking at autonomous operation of these types of vehicles. We currently have a proposal in uh, to a funder to uh, bring across automotive autonomy technology onto the Coventry shuttle 
and link that with 5G uh, technology um, to, to give uh, what we hope will be a forerunner to a fully autonomous solution in the future. Um, now, that may seem very ambitious. <clears throat> We've always had the idea that we don't intend to employ hundreds of people in the centre and duplicate what already can be done elsewhere. Uh, as I said, our focus is very much about uh, the system, uh, delivering a system. So we want to use a hub and spoke model, and there are a number of what I'd call spokes, as you can see on this diagram, uh, that radiate out from the centre, uh, education providers, uh, R&D um, partners, uh, the regulators, etc. We will be working uh, very collaboratively with all of these uh, stakeholders, um, and where possible, we will use those partners to deliver technical work, and we will <clears throat> ensure that we're not duplicating equipment or resources in the center. So I'm coming towards the end now, just want to introduce you to the launch team that is working with me, uh, Richard Jones, uh, he's well known at the RIA, uh, he recently left the RIA to come and join me as the Business Development and Partnerships Manager. Naomi Arblaster, who's our SME Business Advisor, and she's got quite a task in both interesting businesses in um, getting involved in Very Light Rail, but also trying to uh, en encourage uh, black country SMEs who uh, surround where we're based encourage them to, to get more involved in innovation in manufacturing. Olivia Brown, who's my operations and marketing manager, and Vicky Davey, who deals with our finances. So um, I hope you found that interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, encourage anybody that uh, is interested to follow up and get, uh, get in contact with us. Uh, if you download a copy of this uh, of these slides, you can see our uh, email address is there. Uh, you can see our website. Um, we often uh, put out uh, posts on LinkedIn. So please, if there's anything that you uh, are interested in or you've got questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, so much appreciated. And a uh, little under time as well. Well done, Nick. Well done, Nick. But um, I think we'll keep your questions until the end with the panel, if that's OK. And we'll just uh, we'll take those extra five minutes so we can have a, a good session in the Q&A, if that's OK. Uh, with yourself. Thanks, Nick. No worries. Well, uh, like I say, I'm sure we all agree that that sounds very exciting and very interesting. Uh, certainly does to me, anyway. <laughs> and uh, now I'd like to introduce everyone to Neil Cooney. Uh, who's the technical director of Stored Energy Technology Limited, and he's going to be talking to us about their ActiRail uh, project, uh, and uh, is asking the question: Is it a superfood for the rail industry? Which I'm sure has got everyone very interested. So, Neil, I'll uh, pass over to you now, if that's okay. You there, Neil? Hello. Hey, Neil. Oh, yeah. can you have you, any camera on, Neil, as well? Yeah. Cool. I'll pass up. There we are. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Neil Cooney from Stored Energy Technology, or SET as we like to call ourselves. Um, today I'd like to tell you about um, a system we're calling ActiWheel. Um, some of the audience have, have, have been and visited um, our technology demonstrator and I've, I've talked about this system in um, various events um, from different contexts, but um, in this presentation, I'd like to really talk about its benefits in terms of light weighting. Um, and you know, I was trying to think what we've what we've understood about our system is is it can have a lot of different impacts, and it's it's quite. It's quite exciting what it can do, so hence why I've come up with the, the idea of a superfood for the rail industry. Um, a little bit of this may make a, a world of difference, but what I'm going to present to you will hopefully um, give you a better understanding of what we've achieved, what it can, what it could possibly do for people, and um, where we can take it from there. 
So I'll just move on to the next slide. Should be that. No, it always leaps a slide forwards. There we are. Um, so some of the key areas in which um, the ActiWheel system um, can have an impact. It can certainly, um, it's quite a lightweight system in terms of delivering tractive um, effort for kilos of weight effectively. Um, it's it's using technologies that are very akin to automotive um, traction motors, you know, and there's a lot of development in lightweight technologies there and very efficient motors. Um, and thereby that lightweighting and those modern technologies mean we've got very efficient energy conversion within them. Um, we also, we think, the, the original premise behind us, us doing this, um, why we've, we've been engaged in projects for quite a few years on, on with this technology, was about wear of um, wheels and rail. And we've there's a lot of life ex extension in those products that we can achieve with this system. So that actually is, it's healthier for the train, it's healthier for the track. And because it doesn't generate noise and um, debris in the same way that a conventional rail traction system will do, um, it's actually healthier for the passengers as well and healthier for the environment. Um, so I'll go a bit further, next slide. Um, so in terms of, uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the actual uh, benefits it can achieve. And then I'll tell you about what we've demonstrated so far. So um, it's a lightweight traction system. We are um, putting in wheel motors um, which, depending on, on the application, um, will weigh anything from about 30 kilos up to about 250 kilos, um, depending on how fast and you want to go and how quickly you wish to accelerate. Um, 250 kilos may be suitable for a high-speed train, um, whereas uh, some of the 30 kilo ones may be suitable for a, um, a commuter train um, with relatively low acceleration rates. It's a case of, uh, it's a scalable solution to meet a range of different requirements. and by scalable, there's, there's, it's not just the physical scale, but many of the design parameters that can change. Um, but it's it's mo these modern mo motor technologies, um, and we're using techniques that are, are well proven in aerospace sectors. In um, one of the one of the manufacturing techniques is used in offshore um, oil drilling heads because they're a very high uh, high vibration environment and um, high pressure environment. Um, but Altogether, it, it reduces the mass of the motors is, is one of the things that we're doing. So the, the uns, well, the unsprung weight slightly increases, but the overall spring, spring weight dramatically reduces. We've done some work with uh, one train and we've, we've saved over one of the, with a bogey that originally weighed 6.7 tons with its traction system. We've moved it down to just over four tons. Um, now, one of the benefits of, of having, having full in-wheel motors means we, um, we can deliver full service braking with them as well as the attractive effort. And that means you can make significant compromises on um, the braking systems. You can effectively eliminate um, service pneumatic braking and you, all you need to do is then have a, a relatively simple parking brake system. And, and depending on the application, an emergency brake system if you require the redundancy. Um, but what it what it does this this weight saving really reduces the vertical track forces um, and it reduces the tractive effort required to accelerate the the unit. Now the other main drive bit and the the really clever bit so putting putting motors in wheels is 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 all very well it, there's, but there's nothing revolutionary about that um, apart from the wheels are going around of course the the really clever part of what we're doing is, is a steering system that um, we, we use a technology very similar to um, you'd find on an automotive application where you know you, you vector the torque to individual wheels to achieve the correct steering angle. And we, we, we've got some design features within our systems that allow us to control the angle of attack of the wheels to deliver optimum steering. Now that has many secondary benefits to it in terms of how it's friendly to the um, to the track, um, not only are we keeping the avoiding the flange contact with the rail, um, but we we also um, can significantly 
avoid contact at critical points within the network, such as points and crossings. And we've we've done a little bit of work on um, when we actually approach um, uh, switchblades on crossings and looked at the amount of force that we generate on those rails and especially in shock and we can we find we can dramatically reduce those levels which gives us some possibly some opportunities in lighter, lighter track structures Come on next slide please computer so we're back to, back to talking about these motors a little bit um it is overall energy um, efficiency of conversion. Um, we've done some modeling work and we, we, we think we can probably get between seven to 10% reduction in energy used through, um, through, the, through the effective steering of the, the wheels down the track, through the very efficient motors. The, these motors we can get into the 97 to 98% efficiency um, and by the, the the full regeneration capability not only do they deliver tractive effort at 97 to 98 percent efficiency they can also regenerate that energy and if we can store it effectively or feed it back into the grid you end up with um, a very efficient traction to drive a, a route um, we did a little bit of modeling um, on the circle line and we'd be we'd be saving over 10 percent in terms of energy now that 10 percent in energy saving um, if we assume we're in the world of hydrogen powered or battery powered trains can lead to a smaller power supply, um, a smaller battery pack or um, an increased range. Um, yeah, so as part of that, the lower rolling resistance that we can achieve is, is, is quite noticeable. Um, one of the things we've, we've, we've played around with is using our system with the wheels locked conventionally um, and then allowing them to steer and looked at the amount of energy that we actually re require to curve. Um, and it's, it's quite impressive the difference that can be measured in that activity. The other thing it, it delivers, um, once you get to tighter radius curvature is um, significantly lower noise because we have both of the wheels on a, across an axle in perfect rolling contact with um, the railhead. We're not in the situation where we're getting excessive creep or slip, which is often a source of noise. And um, we did some did some work on a, a piece of line and um, there was comments that this was probably one of the quietest um, pieces of stock that ever been taken down that piece of line. Um, the other thing which um, when we start to look at low floor and compact vehicles is it's a very compact traction system. Um, we, we've got these in-wheel motors and the, these motors in some applications will only be 50 or 60 millimeters wide um, and can basically fit within the, um, the wheel structure, uh, the, pro, the existing profile of the wheel structure. Um, we don't have an axle between them or we don't need a solid axle between them so we can we can have drop axles so we're able to achieve um, low floor capabilities down to in one case we've done a, a 30 300 millimeter low floor capability um, but also these wheels because there's no gearbox um, there's no other drive motors they can really minimize the intrusion into the passenger compartment which of course increases the usable space So there's a whole raft of benefits that we can we, we talk about in this, and and this can be exploited in in light rail situations in many different ways, um, both from the structure of the vehicles, from the refueling and recharging capacities, from the the, the structural strength of the infrastructure the train rides on. If we're nicer to the track, and um, the train is lighter, then changes could be made to infrastructure or if you're um, rekindling some old beaching cut lines you may not need to build such a big bridge if you were running stock of this nature um, with this, this system on it we can that with the low floor capability you could even use smaller tunnels and have lower platforms um, but those are you know we, we need the network opportunities to be able to demonstrate this kind of technology so 
we're an SME um, and you know, being an SME, you have a limited capability of how many of the problems you can solve. We, we, we do a lot of innovative and investigative work and we do so, solutions for people, um, but they're mainly electronics and electromechanical systems, but high integrity and safety critical is a lot of the work we do. Um, and these projects that we've been talking about, we've been very much partnered with the IRR at Huddersfield and Loughborough University's um, controls group. But we're quite pleased we won um, the, one of the industry competitions recently um, for innovation. So just to give you a bit of background, um, we ran a project between 2014 to 2016 where we did a light rail um, solution. This was to get, to get down to really tight radius curvature, 13 meters, and deliver a low floor solution. Um, this was funded, um, well, supported by the RSSB, and we, we got to the point of demonstrating the, the, the old tram, it was a Blackpool tram, um, demonstrating it on some track. Um, a bit limited in terms of being able to access test track, so um, Nick's facility would would have been very useful to us at this point because trying to run um, tram systems on um, heavy um, mainline um, geometry is quite a challenge, with especially at points of crossings. And then more recently, um, We've, with the support of Viva Rail, we've um, taken an old D78 and converted it into a full active wheel powered train with active steering and guidance. And um, this this is really has really worked very well. And throughout the latter part of last year, we did a range of demonstrations to um, customers, um, to potential customers, and to the industry. And in virtually all cases, people were very impressed by what they saw and the the impact upon that vehicle and the quality of ride and the quietness and the smoothness and the robustness of it um, gave a lot of very positive comments. Um, this solution was a, a 90 mile an hour spec um, designed for the mass of that train um, and the performance levels of um, about 1.3 meter per second squared acceleration with a fully laden train. So that just the, the motors, as you can see in that picture on the bottom left corner, don't extend much from within the wheel well um, that you can see. Those black covers are effectively covering the motor. So I hope people have um, understood a little bit of what I've been saying and um, can see why I think it's it's a superfood for the rail industry, why it, it could make an astounding difference to the rail industry by having such systems integrated into um, rolling stock. Um, in terms of the benefits we can see, in terms of that from all the all those different areas. So, in summary, was oh, that slide? Hang on. Um, you know, this is a technology that supports lightweight and low-cost infrastructures. Um, it's very energy efficient. It's good for space. It can achieve tight curving and high speed in one package. That's the beauty of having a, a dynamic control system. It can be stable while we're running at very high speeds and it can be um, controllable and capable running on tight geometries. Um, we're doing a lot of, we've got some other innovation, um, well, some other development programs going on. So we're going to, going to go and explore some very high speed operation. Um, and uh, do some demonstration of that. So we're very confident it's, it can be fitted into a whole range of products, but it is breaking free from a, a principle that's been around for many, many years of the solid axle being part of the system that steers the train. It is a full modern digital system that actively understands its position and guides it down the track. So um, I'd like to, like to finish at that point and um, hopefully there's questions. Uh, thank you, Neil. That's uh, bang on time. So I'll uh, we'll keep we'll, uh, we'll wait until uh, everyone speaks and spoken, and we'll uh, go through the questions then. Unless, and like I say, you are you are Nick want to answer any questions that you see in the chat box while our other uh, colleagues are presenting. But thank you very much, Neil. That was a excellent, another thank excellent you. presentation and some very interesting innovations there. Now, uh, can you just take your uh, video off for me, please. No, cheers, thank you. Now, uh, moving on to shifting gears a bit, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Julian Turner, who's from Westfield Cars, um, who's here to, who's going to ask the question: Can we trust autonomy? Is that correct, Julian? I've got, have I got that right? Um, yeah. Yep. 
Phil. So I will uh, pass on to you and uh, see what. Uh, that's, uh, and it looks, and as you can see, it's uh, on a slightly different system. Thank you very much, Julian. Much appreciate. Great, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Julian Turner, uh, and I'm the uh, chief executive of Westfield Technology Group. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today. Oh, I've got any control. Sorry. Um, talk to you today. Uh, give you a bit of intro into Westfield, the autonomous control system, and then actually look at some innovations uh, that, that um, in essence, are going to question whether they can be taken across from the automotive sector into the rail industry um, and um, applied there. So Westfield won the innovation, uh, Global Innovation uh, Autocar Award in 2018. Um, we're a 36-year-old uh, British niche vehicle manufacturer. Uh, we've got 20,000 vehicles in the field. Um, we've got various ISO approvals, but one thing that we do have is we are the only autonomous pod producer that has European small series type approval. And who knows what that means um, after the end of this year. Um, but um, that gives us a unique selling point because it's a globally recognized standard where we can actually self-certify for some of the components and, and products that we manufacture. Um, we're fortunate enough to be um, IOD West Midlands Exporter, Director and SME of the Year, which we're really proud of as well, um, showing you that obviously we've um, expanded this internationally, which is a great achievement for such new technology. Um, we've got various uh, ISO accreditations. Like I say, we get um, audited every year by the Vehicle Certification Agency, but I'm not really interested in that today because I'm really keen to try and improve and introduce more manufacturing in the UK. Uh, and we're proud to actually manufacture everything in the UK and 78% of that within the Midlands, which I think is really, really important. For those that you don't know what I'm talking about with these crazy pod things, um, there's actually a system in uh, operation down at London Heathrow Terminal 5 um, car park, uh, and that's transporting people from a um, car park um, on a uh, track down to the Heathrow Airport Terminal 5 departures door. Um, that system used to be completed by bus and was replaced by um, these uh, pure electric uh, autonomous pods. Um, the pod systems been um, operating pretty much 24 hours a day. It's taken now three and a half million passengers um, and has completed successfully over six million kilometers. Um, there's a reduction uh, of sort of 20 minutes compared to a bus journey. Um, so you can go from the car park to the terminal door uh, in about six minutes. 95% of passengers are served under one minute, which again proves it's an on-demand system and works extremely well. There is a benefit over trains and buses, um, as well as a benefit over emissions for cars. Um, the system actually has now been expanded four times. It's been so successful. Uh, and the stats for the last quarter show it's been 99% reliable. Again, which I think is a fantastic achievement for a system of this type. Um, to me, what's really important about this is actually it's taken off the road 70,000 bus journeys um, every year. So the Heathrow pod system, um, you can see it, sorry, in operation here. Um, for those of you who don't believe what I'm saying. Um, so like I've said, this is a um, pure electric vehicle um, that runs between the car park. Uh, it can seat pretty much up to six people plus luggage um, and um, takes about six minutes to go. Um, there are stations both at the terminal and at the car park that you walk up to, press a button, in you get, off you go. Um, so that's really um, quite simple and it works very, very well. So some of the questions I want you to think about, can materials actually make it lighter? So some of the technology that we've installed in these vehicles and have been trialing, testing and put into commercial operation are very lightweight battery systems made out of graphene. Now, some of you may have heard about graphene. Um, we've actually installed this as a power plant in the vehicle, which enables our pod to charge in pretty much two minutes. The advantage this has over something like lithium, um, obviously it has 100,000 cycles compared to your standard lithium battery, which has between two to 3,000. So in the case of um, transferring this over to a rail or even the pod industry, um, you can actually have the battery outweigh and outlast the frame of the vehicle in some, in some ways, um, which I think is very important. There's no exothermic reaction so if you have you know unfortunate enough to have an impact with something um, there's no explosion or um, molten metal put in the air it carries on running at 100 uh, which again is very very important 
You may think I may have um, doctored the middle photograph. Um, this is actually the world's lightest metallic polymer. Um, so this was uh, invented by the Boeing company, uh, I think it's about seven, eight years ago now. Um, and that's actually a metallic polymer sitting on top of a dandelion. Um, and in essence, what we've been doing is to try and look at taking serious amounts of weight out of the vehicle, um, such as uh, in the bodywork, in the floor, uh, as well as using this, this technology um, and innovation in things like coiled springs, um, because we think it's very important. Um, oh, crikey. Sorry. Uh, very important that you try and, and reduce that weight because it actually extends the range of the vehicles by quite a substantial amount. Quite a substantial amount. Um, we've also been using biocomposites in the bodywork. Uh, again, this has been made, you know, sort of half a mile away from us, uh, which I think is really important. Having that capability of a hundred percent recyclable bodywork made out of hemp and linseed oil. Um, and we've been trialling that in uh, well all over the world in both our sports cars and in our autonomous vehicles, uh, as well as combining sensing um, into the um, into the bodywork. We think it's uh, certainly a way of the future um, of, of times to come. Uh, we've also installed very lightweight, high tensile um, me metal tubing in the vehicles. So where you'd use conventional steel or perhaps even aluminium, um, we've worked closely with um, Reynolds tubing, which is predominantly found in cycle um, um, pedal cycles. And um, we've actually installed that now in our vehicles, uh, as well as all our autonomous vehicles. Again, some fabulous technology designed, developed in the UK that can be taken across from sectors such as aviation, uh, automotive and taken into the rail industry. Sorry, it's just catching up. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so yeah, so sensing, again, another question, can this assist? Um, we um, have a uh, autonomous sensing platform, which consists of radar, LIDAR, ultrasonic camera, uh, and actually touch sensitive. Um, you can see the vehicle um, operating here at Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in London, uh, which is next to a children's playground. The system can actually track 630 items, 360 degrees around the vehicle all at once, which I think is quite a substantial amount. Um, so can we take some of this technology um, across from you know, the auto autonomous vehicles and automotive through into the rail? The door systems, uh, again, you know, we've taken nearly 4 million passengers um, using this door system. It is a patented system, um, but the vehicle will not operate or go anywhere if the doors have not been closed properly or if there is something trapped both in the sides or actually in the center um, there are door sensitive edge strips as well as um, door sensitive um, edging um, and controls on the motors itself as well the other thing that we're using like i said is cameras for the um, for the vehicle so as our rail uh, and trams are going along can it be detecting rubbish um, as it um, is doing here we've launched the world's first uh, autonomous road sweeper with um, Booker Municipal or Johnson Sweepers in the UK. So that technology does exist and can be taken over to detect things like potholes. Um, it can detect vehicles that have perhaps been abandoned and send the GPS coordinates to councils. It can be me measuring live emissions and that's what we're already doing at street level. Um, I don't know if you know but a lot of the live emission stations are actually stationed up in the air um, so we don't think it's a very accurate measure of what we're doing. If you really want to expand it to do things like face recognition and ANPR, uh, automatic number plate recognition, that's something else that can be put on very easily on all of these. Um, but most importantly, we believe things like predictive movements. So people jumping inside or in and out of the vehicle uh, or door just before the train, tram, or even the autonomous vehicle gets off um, before it starts off. Um, obviously, we are also um, working on tracking people and objects near its path because we're actually estimating um, when these people will come in front of it and what reaction the vehicle um, should have. So you can see here, um, the vehicle's actually been bespokely designed for Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, um, so that when you get close to it, it starts to slow down. And if you enter into a safety bounding box, uh, which is like an invisible bubble behind around the vehicle, it will actually completely stop. So you can see it can detect down to two centimeters. Um, unfortunately, I'm slightly wider than larger than that. Uh, but I think you can get my drift by lying in front of it um, where it's actually completely stopped, the object's removed and obviously then the vehicle will carry on. Um, 
we, re we tuned this autonomous control system specifically for the um, park to allow cyclists and electric scooters to come within close vicinity of the vehicle from be the behind and from the sides. And obviously, if anything um, tracks close to the vehicle, then it does, uh, as you can see there, stop as soon as it gets into that safety bubble. That is a very complex system which has been tried and tested over 3,000 autonomous electric brake tests, um, which has been conducted independently um, by Loughborough University and ACOM. So one of the other things I think is a great advantage of the, is the, actually the environment. Computers don't get tired. They work day, they work night, they work 24 hours a day. They also don't bypass a process or a procedure. One of the things that we've uh, been very clear about installing on our vehicles is a three or four redundant, independent redundant system. So if we do have a failure, then there are other systems that can take over and continue operating the vehicle or will stop the vehicle uh, and allow people to get off um, in the event of an emergency. So you can see the vehicle can operate in the snow, it can operate at night, can operate in sunshine, can operate when there's uh, leaves around um, or the sun's low. Um, all of this technology has already been developed and it's something that can be very easily taken over um, to other industries. Some of the technology on the outside we've just talked about, but there's also fantastic technology inside the vehicle. Um, so like I said, taking from the top right, we've got something called a dynamic bounding box. So as the vehicle is entering different types of environment, um, we can actually alter the size of the safety bubbles, alter what it does with the predictive paths, um, it can automatically know whether it's near vehicles or whether it's in a pedestrian area. You can have uh, technology on it, such as voice assist, um, which is a bit like um, our Alexas that you, you may have at home or at work, so that you can actually communicate with the vehicle and it can communicate back. And I think that's really important for people that are um, partially sighted um, or mobility impaired to have that capability and that technology. We already have that um, operating up in the Lake District National Park. Um, which again is quite a unique um, situation in itself. Um, obviously 5G um, being put into these um, vehicles and products allows you to share data instantly. And what we're using it for is to um, upload the latest mapping information and data on the vehicles, mainly because we are checking every second, at least every second, 350 different items on the vehicle. One of the big things that we're really interested in is something called um, V2X or vehicle to tram or vehicle to rail. And this is actually linking autonomous vehicles to the trains so that you know when to set off from home, get on a pod and it will take you to the local train station. And that's either using the CES or even using disused lines to meet up with some of the um, trains and trams. And this is all about having a connected journey, providing you that relevant information so that you have your journey automatically altered to make sure you're there on time because that can certainly remove a huge amount of vehicles off the road. Again, it's very common for people to drive less than two miles to go and park at the train station, leave their car there all day and then drive back at the end of the day, um, all using diesel, cold start, really poor emissions. One of the systems we have operating at the UNESCO um, World Heritage Site at the Lake District is an infotainment system. So at certain waypoints, it's giving you information about um, where you can buy things or even um, where things were written uh, as a bit of a, a you know, tourist. But just think what you can do for those people that um, may not be able to see. It can actually give them information that the vehicle's starting to slow down, that you're coming up to a junction, that you're going to turn left, that you need to sit on this side of the vehicle because it's going to be going in this direction. There's some really interesting technology that I think can be taken over both externally and internally, um, which is important. So um, rather than me telling you how good um, the pods are, uh, I think it's really important and we're very proud to show this uh, of the pod system operating at Heathrow. So out of the 9,239 reviews that we've had on the pod system, uh, we've had nine, uh, nine marks out of 10, which I think is a fabulous um, bit of feedback that we've had. Um, you can see the stats itself, I'm not lying. This is live on a website and it's really important uh, to me that people are interested and excited about using this technology because if you make it more convenient it will make a big difference to people's lives and you will need to expand it and grow the system as we have done with the pods that's pretty much from it from me if you want to contact me my details are there and i think we're taking questions at the end so thank you very much thank you very much julian that's uh, excellent very much appreciate again another one spot on time i'm getting a uh... 
all the i'm getting all the good speakers i think today <laughs> thank you very much everyone uh now it's time to get on to our um five minute elevator pictures and uh, our first one is uh from dr graham lee uh from the warwick manufacturing group and uh, i'd like to welcome dr lee he's going to be presenting us about the work they've been carrying on on intelligent vehicles so quite pertinent to what we've just been discussing to the last two or three presentations actually and uh how they're getting to boards autonomous for very light rail. So Graham, thank you very much. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay. Afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, thank, thank you to the organizers for allowing me to speak uh, this afternoon. So here's my uh, very, very quick five minute elevator pitch. Um, so the purpose of this presentation very much is to tell you a little bit more about the intelligent vehicles research group at WMG. Um, and to look at, um, you know, as a summary, some of the benefits of autonomy, which Julian's uh, covered mostly, um, but also some of the remaining challenges as well. So, uh, a little bit about WMG, and, and you know, in case for for the people who don't know us, um, we are an academic department within the University of Warwick. We make up roughly 40% of the entire university's research activity, so a fairly large department. And um, within that department, you have the Intelligent Vehicles Research Group, which is where I sit. Um, and we, you know, a lot of our work, as you, as you can possibly imagine at the moment when we talk about intelligent vehicles is centered around on-road autonomy, uh, you know, cars on, on roads. And really our work breaks down to loosely sort of in these four categories and never, it never quite fits within the four categories all the time. But it's things like uh, autonomy. So, you know, things that Julian has been talking about in terms of looking at perception systems, um, sensor systems, making decisions and actually ultimately controlling the vehicle. The cooperative bit comes from actually sharing information between different vehicles or between the infrastructure and the vehicles to enable autonomy. Then you have the connectivity elements in terms of how you move data around, whether that be 4G, 5G, DSRC. We look at verification and validation. So this is test methodology. How do you ensure your system is actually safe, your autonomous control system is actually safe to then roll out? Uh, and then of course, human factors as well. How does the human interact with something that's semi-autonomous or fully autonomous? And being a university or you know part of a university, we 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 actually work right across the, the TRL spectrum. So everything from EPSRC, blue sky research, all the way through to sort of prototyping and commercialization um, with companies and, and other universities as well. So there's a, a few few active projects uh, to logos at the bottom of here. Um, so, you know, we, we also are quite fortunate, you know, we have, we have a wealth of facilities and expertise to support our novel research, um, you know, mainly sort of modeling and simulation, testing in you know, hybrid control environments, test tracks, all the way through to actually deploying algorithms and testing full systems and integrating full systems onto real vehicles, onto real roads. So that's a little bit about us. But when we talk about um, automation, um, you know, particularly for VLR, uh, what what is it that we we mean? What is it that we want to get to? I think most of us, it's really we want to get to a point where there's no driver, no attendant on board, and and what are the benefits that could be realised um, through this? Again, this has been highlighted through you know several of the talks over the past few days, but here's a very very short summary, I guess. The key one really here is is safety, and this has been mentioned many many times, and um, the removal of the you know the human driver to to the reduction of human error. Um, the ability to control the vehicle in a very specific way, you know, smooth, smooth um, change of acceleration, different speed profiles, highly controlled, highly configured and optimized, which would in turn um, provide more energy efficient um, vehicles, greater comforts for the, cam um, for the, for the, uh, for the customers or the passengers, uh, and ultimately reduce wear and tear on key systems, or at least be potentially be able to predict wear and tear on systems. The other is, of course, cost and particularly operating costs. So the removal of the driver. Yeah. So we all know how how big of a cost that is on uh, service operators. So really, it's, it's two very very key points here, which is a safer tram service and potentially lower operating costs, and um, which then opens up different operating models for um, uh, tram operators. So potentially shorter track carriages, but more frequent service. Um, which ultimately results in uh, increased appeal of these types of system and hopefully increased um, public use of these uh, public transport um, modalities. When it comes to challenges, well, again, we've, this has been highlighted through um, you know, several of the talks already. 
And talking specifically about autonomous functions, really you have the three key functions. You have perception, which is the ability to see around you, understand around what's around you, the ability to understand where you are, so path planning, where you are, where you want to get to, how you're going to get there, and ultimately control the vehicle to, to get you there. But of course, buried within that, you have many, many more difficult problems, you know, cybersecurity problems, safety, how do you ensure it's safe enough and actually then commercialize the system and roll it out. And then supporting technologies and systems to actually make the thing go. Signaling, trackside infrastructure, et cetera. So how, how, how is it that we could potentially help? So as I mentioned, um, the IV group uh, primarily we work in uh, automotive sector. Um, so, you know, cars typically is what you see down the right hand side here. And really what, you know, from, from several of our projects, we, we see there's a lot of um, skills and knowledge that can be transferred between um, the automotive sector into the real sector. Um, so using simulation to do mapping, um, object detection, sensor fusion, and putting it all together to actually uh, do on-road testing and design of the infrastructure as well to support the communication of data to support autonomy. So very, very last slide, a very, very quick summary. So, you know, pl plenty plenty of challenges. Um, I'm going to run out of time. Plenty of challenges, um, but certainly, you know, there's, there's, there's an opportunity here to really exploit what we've learned within the automotive spec sector and transfer that into real, but not only that, to exploit potentially the economies of scale within the automotive sector to drive down the unit costs within the real sector as well. So very much, um, you know, just a shout out to, to come get in touch, uh, discuss some ideas, see if there's an opportunity to collaborate. Thank you. Carl, you're on mute. Thank you very much, Greg. Sorry, everyone. I've uh, managed to make it through the whole session without making the, the uh, classic mistake. Uh, but there we go. Uh, and just to finish off, uh, now I'm going to pass the hand over to Colin Robbins from Nexor. He's going to tell us all about um, a very hot topic at the moment, cybersecurity, particularly for trams. And uh, I've got to say, uh, Graham, I love the title of your presentation. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm Colin Robbins, and I lead the cybersecurity consulting team at Nexor. And we've been working with both Westfield and uh, Warwick Manufacturing Group on a number of projects over recent times. As um, Graham said, one of the key aspects that, that we're, we're looking at with, with vehicles is, is safety. Um, but what our role has been is to look at how cybersecurity can potentially affect safety. And, and so have, have looked at one of particular deployments um, in depth, and, and that's the deployment that uh, um, Julian talked about, about the pods, where they were done in trials at the, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Now, in, in, in my title, I re reference, next slide, um, the, the sort of Bitcoins. R ransomware, as, as we all hear from the, the press, is, is a big topic right now. It's how cyber criminals have now established ways of monetizing their ability to break into systems. And we're seeing a move from encrypting data and saying we want ransomware to unencrypt your data to using ransomware to take control of systems. And, and we can certainly expect that they have transport systems in their sites. To understand the scale of this, um, Last year, it was estimated that ransomware demands generated revenues of 1 billion US dollars for the criminals. So this is a huge criminal enterprise that is very profitable right now because not only they're generating those revenues, but the risks of, of getting caught are generally quite low. So very, very briefly, if you look at the diagram I've got there of the tram and the person, clearly to make this automated world and interaction world there is data that passes from the vehicle to the operators and then in turn the operators send instructions back what we found is that the majority of time people look at the interaction between that interaction and, and focus their security there if i'm an attacker i'm just going to look at that and say well done but it makes no difference to me because that's not where i'm going to operate what we've seen and, and what we found in working on those projects is that that the weaknesses are in the infrastructure and the supply chain. And that's why I'm particularly keen to, to pitch to you here 
because each and every one of your businesses sits somewhere in that supply chain. That's where your business operates, but also that's where the attackers will operate. It's through that system, though it's through your companies and your systems that the attackers will look to take control of the vehicle. And, and the vehicle will see what it believes to be completely legitimate instructions to stop or, or to go and block a junction or, or to crash into a wall. Hopefully some of the onboard systems will prevent some of that, but certainly causing mass disruption is, is, is what you, you could potentially do. Or, to, as I said in my headlines, take complete control of the vehicle and say you're, you're not getting control back until you pay a ransom. So very quickly, um, what we're trying to say is that there, there are the three sort of myths of cybersecurity. It's a complex technical subject. It isn't. It doesn't need to be. It's all about understanding your assets, understanding your risks and putting governance in place. Things businesses do very well if you operate from the board level. These cyber attacks, you know, the press loves making them sound really, really sophisticated. They're not. It's the equivalent of someone walking down the street and trying the door handle on every single vehicle. If they find a vehicle that's open, they will take what's inside. It is as simple as that. And protecting is as simple as that. We all now know to make sure we've locked our car doors and hidden what's inside. That's what we now need to do across the supply chain to prevent the, these kind of attacks. And finally, there's kind of the mythology that we're unlikely to be a target. Well, now that cyber criminals have, have learned to monetize this, that's untrue. If your business transacts money in any way, you are a target. They will find a way to get at that money. So what do you need to do to manage that risks? First of all, it has to happen at, at, at a board level. I think most boards now recognize it's an issue, but don't know how to deal with it. And, and that's what Nexor is set, set up to help you with. Myself and my colleagues will help boards understand the methodologies that they can use to put the governance me mechanisms in place. As I say, it's not a technology issue, it's a, government is a governance issue. And, and, and the single biggest thing you can do is appoint someone with responsibility for managing that, the so-called chief information security officer. A number of businesses on this call will be small to medium enterprises and won't have a full-time role for a chief information security officer, but do need someone in that role with expertise. And again, that's where organizations like Nexor can help we can provide that role on a part-time basis. If you want to look at doing it yourself, again, Julian mentioned some of the standards they've implemented in the business. And one of those he mentioned was ISO 27001, which is a sign of good governance. And another is Cyber Essentials, which are a very, very simple prescriptive controls that you can put in place to give confidence that you've done at least the basics. And, and again, Nexor is very much able to help you with that. So if any of that interests you, um, very much uh, be available in the Zoom breakout uh, meetings after this call. And the one thing that I'm happy to offer is that if anyone does contact us in the Zoom breakouts, we're happy to offer a half day free consultation to look at how you can improve the cybersecurity of your business. If you can't make the breakouts, my contact details are below. Thank you very much, Colin. That was uh, excellent, and uh, I say a very pertinent one. Can I ask all the speakers now to put their uh, cameras back on, uh, please? Uh, you can stay on, Colin, as well. Uh, you, 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 you yourself as well, Colin. <laughs> yeah. We've got Colin. We've got Neil. We've got Graham. Um, ah, there's Nick. So that's everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to go. We'll go through some of the questions that's been uh, that have been sent. Um, I'll start with one that uh, Sam's asked that we present this to the whole panel. If anyone would like to answer, um, yesterday's ruling by the coroner that air pollution does kill, in particular, parts per million PM 2.5 S, which are generated by rubber wheels created road tire dust. Apparently, that's uh, that was. I, I must confess, I haven't read the whole news article. But does the panel see this pollution free at point to use mode? Um, this pollution free at point of use mode in the urban transport coming to the fore. So do we see this as an issue going forward? Um, yes, there was a comment from uh, someone in government the other day saying that um, they, they see this as a, a growing problem 
In fact, I joked uh, about nine months ago to somebody that eventually we'll be uh, seeing the um, abolition of rubber tyres and uh, vehicles running around on metal wheels on tarmac. But yes, it is a, an issue and there's research going on to create machines that actually we will in effect vacuum up the dust as a vehicle goes along. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it is a big problem and um, the particles are worse than diesel soot. So young children breathing them in, worse than having diesel cars running along the road. It is a big problem. Right. Thank you, Nick. Does anyone else want to add a comment to this one before I move on? No. Okay. Thank you very much. I must confess that's very interesting. I haven't read the article yet. I wasn't aware that that was one of the findings. So that's, that's very interesting. Uh, Nick, if I, I'll start with uh, questions for Nick. Um, one for you is, um, how do you manage uh, the IP issues between different participants at the centre? Uh, yeah, I apologise, I didn't reply to that. I was, <laughs> my attention was, uh, I was trying to watch the other presentations. IP is managed or will be managed in the same way as it's managed in uh, any collaborative project, um, whether there is public funding involved or not. Um, we actually draw up a collaboration agreement at the before the project starts and that sets out what background IP the various parties hold that will remain their property. It sets out what foreground IP may be generated and who within the consortium um, might wish to exploit that. So um, it, it's, I, I've, I've been in R&D for many, many years and, and years ago, there was a tendency to start a project uh, and you got to the end and then there was a, a bun fight as to who was going to have the IP. That is not the way that uh, that is effective or useful. So you agree it at the beginning and some partners will be interested in specific bits of foreground IP. Um, others may want all of it, but you agree it and you come to an arrangement. All right. Excellent. Uh, just sticking with you one for one more, Nick, if that's OK. Um, does the track uh, have the capability to have a, to build a loop circuit in for uh, potentially longer test runs? I want to ask. Uh, well, <laughs> if we're putting one loop in, um, we are a little bit uh, landlocked. Um, what we've got on the, on the long test track, uh, we've it used to be a, a dual track railway. We've got our test track going down uh, along the alignment where one of the tracks used to be. We've got a complete uh, alignment next to that where we can put another track. Um, in terms of providing larger loops, um, that's not something I could do at the moment, um, given the you know the actual land that we are uh, in possession of. Um, so I was actually asked yesterday, interestingly, whether we could host a miniature railway track, uh, which might become used by the IMAC E um, railway challenge every year. Um, I can't fit that in. I, well, I don't think I can fit that in on the land we've got, but actually very close to us, there is a plot of land and I've spoken to Dudley Council and we might actually be able to put that railway, you know, within walking distance of where we are. So there are things we can do. But um, just remember that we're based where Dudley Station used to be. And right. um, it, it's approached from both directions along a series of cuttings and embankments. You know, we haven't got large areas of land for big well, loop. Yeah, uh, I think the question was, is there a loop there to try and like run things round and round uh, for, for, uh, for like well, what uh, we've exercise got, tests? What we've got is a 15 metre radius loop. Right. Uh, which is for testing specifically the Coventry vehicle because it's designed for 15 metre minimum radius curves. Um, once that testing's done, we could pro we could possibly replace it with a slightly larger uh, continuous loop that um, vehicles could run around. But uh, we're trying to address the needs of customers at the moment and not just put down things which, to some extent, might be speculative. Okay. Right. Thank you, Nick. Um, if I could ask a question to Neil. Um, Neil, uh, and bit, <laughs> that uh, 
it's funny after we've just asked the, the first question we asked, but uh, do you offer active active wheel for rubber tired vehicles or is it only for uh, steel on steel? Um, we've not explored it for rubber tired vehicles. Um, it wouldn't be, it, rubber tired vehicles are generally automotive and um, the steering mechanisms are relatively well understood. Um, so I haven't really explored it, but if you had a very narrow, a, a guided route, then the technology could transfer over. Um, you just lose some of the elegance of that um, steel to steel contact and the particulate matter and all those benefits that we just talked, Nick talked about earlier. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I've just realised I should have given credit to the people who've asked these questions. Sorry. Um, uh, that one was from. Oh, hang on. Well, hang on, I've lost it now. Uh, Uh, the system it's not liking me now um ah, here we are so that was from uh, john emmanuel thank you john for those uh nick just the, the people who ask your your questions for uh, going back working backwards uh, were from uh patrick clipperton and uh, uh and uh Graham Collett. So I apologise for. Uh, oh, and there was one from uh, the the first one about IP was from John Emmanuel. So thank you. Sorry, I should acknowledge those. Uh, I'll make sure I pick those up going forward. So for the uh, next one, I don't have I got another one for you, Neil. Or no, I don't seem to. If I could then go on to Julian, uh, I'll see if there's any more that come up for for you. You seem to have answered quite a few, Neil, in uh, the comments. Uh, Julian, a question from Marina Samandran, which is I've always, a question I've always wondered myself as someone who's used the Heathrow uh, system. Um, yep. How do you recover a failed pod uh, if, uh, if a pod fails? So it has a um, system that you connect up to the front of the vehicle and then you can tow it away with any um, tow bar or any, any towable vehicle, really. It's really simple, right. very quick. So it's just like recovering a normal vehicle. Just slide it in, press a button, off it goes. All oh, right, brilliant. Thank you very much. So is, is that um, can it be pulled by another pod, or is that do the pods not have that much power? Sorry, uh, it, it can be. We tend not to do that, um, but it certainly can do. So at Heathrow, um, it is pulled by another pod, but in an open environment, you can just do it with a normal car, whatever's easier. These only weigh sort of 900 kilograms, so they are quite light compared to a normal vehicle. So you could tow it quite easily, even push it. We push them if we needed to as well. All right, thank you, thank you, Julian. That's excellent. Um, going on to the next one. Oh, another one for you, Julian. Um, are all the uh, these? Hang on, this is from Richard John. Oh no, you answered that one. Forgive me, but that was being answered. I could have um, answered all of them by one from Richard. I think you have yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I have, another which... for, I have another question for Neil here, who which hasn't been answered. Um, Neil, you mentioned data modeling of a ninety miles per hour. Specification active wheel, active wheel bogey. Uh, this is from Alex Dodds. He wants to know: Is this the variant currently fitted to the Viva Rail D train test vehicle? If so, is there scope for higher speed testing on the Viva Rail vehicle beyond the limitation of the existing bogies? Quite a big. So, so, so yeah, the, the 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 90 mile an hour spec is is what we've built that bogey to for the the D train. Um, we haven't tested it up to 90 miles an hour because we're limited by the fact we're using a heritage facility and therefore the speeds are, are a bit lower than that. Um, our dynamic control system changes its behavior as we increase in speed. You know, it, it's fully active. Um, so it's able to change the effective um, damping characteristics of the steering function as we go faster. Um, we are currently working with um, a customer on developing a higher speed solution. Um, so we, we we think we can go to significant higher speeds with control. Okay, um, fair enough. The, the, dy the dynamic from from what we've done in terms of understanding the dynamics of the system and the modelling that we've done that has correlated at the lower speeds, and so that predicts that we should be able to remain in control at much higher speeds, much much higher speeds. In fact, nice one, excellent, thank you. Um, Again, I don't know if uh, you want to answer this one at the moment, uh, Neil, you might want to take this one away. James Harkins said that you, you touched on, uh, and I know we've already touched talked about this subject, you touched on particulates from the wheel 
uh, in your presentation. He's asking what numbers do you have? Uh, I don't know if you want to answer that or if you'd rather leave that one for later. Uh, I don't understand. I think. We, 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 we don't have a, an accurate figure of the impact on particulates. What we do have is, is some modeling of the reduction in wear. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that we're wearing the wheels less means we're producing less particulate matter. The other aspect to it is um, because we can deliver full um, to zero speed braking electrodynamically, um, we're able to eliminate the use of friction brakes, which, you know, if you, if you go on the underground and you, you, you get that familiar taste and smell of the underground, that is mainly metallic dust and brake particle dust that gives a lot, uh, well, and, and hundreds of years of dust um, gives that, that kind of sensation. So we think there's a big benefit to be had there, but we haven't done that modeling in enough detail to give a, a, a figure. Fair enough. Okay, that's uh, fine. Um, gr uh, Colin and Graham, uh, I, I see you've been keeping up with your questions as they've been going along, Graham, particularly. Uh, but there was one for about, uh, if I could just, there was one that said um, uh, what you think the additional cost might be for fitting the AV tech into the VLR vehicle. Um, and will this come down in the future? I know you've answered it, but maybe you could like give a bit of detail yeah. on that one. Yeah, sure. That's a kind of a million dollar question, right? Maybe Julian can help with this one as well. I, I don't know. I mean, that that's a very difficult one, you know, new technology. And um, I think as part of my response, what I said was, you know, as engineers, we tend to over egg these yeah. systems, particularly safety critical systems. And then, of course, yeah. uh, sort of dial it back a little bit. Uh, and I don't know. My prediction is still in the sort of tens of thousands. I mean, if you look at the automotive sector, you know, you have... Yeah. You know, arguably you have a 20 grand, 30 grand vehicle, and then you stick over 100 grand worth of equipment on top to get it to drive autonomously, which is kind of ridiculous at the moment. But as the technology matures, unit cost comes down, economies of scale come into play. You know, of course the cost is going to come down, but where does that end up? That that will also depend on the operating model. How you know how who who owns vehicles, particularly in the automotive sector, who owns vehicles, who buys them, who maintains them, etc. So yeah, a lot at play at the moment. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Graham. That question came from uh, Richard Jones, by the way. Um, uh, I should have said. Um, we seem. I, I'm. Is there any? Uh, there seems to be uh, very few um, uh, questions that you haven't answered. <laughs> I've got to say, and uh, and I think the couple that have just come to Nick. I mean, Nick, there's one that you might want to have a look at offline because there's one about uh, I think asking about the use of your test track. So I won't uh, embarrass you on the, uh, the call. And that. I'll leave you that, that uh, discussion there <laughs> with the uh, with the, they're all from James. I think let me just say I think you need to speak to James Harkins uh, when you have when you have a moment. Um, Colin, can I ask you a question on the uh, on cyber security? Uh, one thing uh, that you, do you do you see that the cybersecurity risk is predominantly because uh, you the way what you were talking about was predominantly about ransomware attacks and I know that's probably like you were saying anywhere business that's monetized. Um, there's a lot of in, people. Uh, do you think that the there is still also a viable threat uh, or real threat from um, how about this non-monetized attacks like the uh, there are a lot of parts of the railway industry that don't deal directly with the transfer of the money to and from the customer. Uh, but their systems are critical to the operation of the railway, both from a safety point of view and um, uh, and a performance point of view. Um, do you think there's a risk of denial of service attacks to those uh, systems uh, going forward, particularly on like trams or rail? I, I, absolutely, and I think the, the 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 main point here is about the supply chain. That if, if at any point in that supply, I can interrupt that point of the supply chain, that I can then move downstream and and, and interrupt the operation of the, of the vehicles. That, that, that then I've got potential to do that. That there are also you know, different threat actors with with different motives, and and so causing disruption is, you know, certainly within the, the realms of, of of activists that that want to make a point. You know, if if they could cause disruption to get some headlines, then then absolutely. So. Unfortunately, we're in a world now where th these types of attacks are, are all too easy to, to um, affect. And, and so, yeah, I think we, we have to predict that, that all of these kind of things are, are likely to happen in, in, in the next few years. Are those sort of attacks uh, more sophisticated than what you mentioned, or are they also actually much more simple than we'd like to think they are? Um, that there's a combination of, of, of both. That there are the very simple, simple to attack 
effect attacks, the walking down the, the street and, and trying the car door. But what we do now see is a very sophisticated black market. And, and so the low level thief that has found the car door open will now sell that on the black market to the highest bidder who says, actually, you know what, that, that's kind of a target I would like to attack and, and we'll buy that access from them. So yeah, the, the fact that this is a billion dollar market um, is now, it's got a very, very sophisticated marketplace behind it. All right, thank you very much, Colin. That's, uh, that's a very concise answer, thank you. Um, if I can add, there's a question from uh, one of our, from Sam Bennett, Bennett to uh, Neil. Uh, Neil, there are clearly, Sam says there's clearly huge benefits to the ActiveRail system. Uh, assuming the drawbacks are easily manageable, what are, can you tell us what those are? Um, is, is there anything that we should be aware of? Or, and also, um, are there any like overseas competition for this or should UK Rail be grabbing this and running with it, do you think? As with any new technology, there's always drawbacks that it's new technology and it's change, which everybody's scared of. Um, there's not really any fundamental um, additional risks with it. So we've looked at the um, derailment risks and the, the stability of the system in failure modes and we we think we're at least as good as conventional systems in one or two situations but in most other situations we can deliver a much safer system so yeah. um, there aren't any big risks beyond new technology um, are there any competitive systems out there there are a couple of other um, organizations that have published papers around similar kind of technologies and there are many people who've develop some in-wheel motors, um, but we, we're not aware of anybody having successfully demonstrated the traction system as a, a full control system doing the steering and guidance function. Um, but yeah, there, there, is, there, will be, there are people working on it um, and uh, it would be good to seize the opportunity. Um, the, the development program that we're, we're going forward with is, is not um, really taking advantage of all of that control system. It's more working on the motor development aspect of it. So we, we are seeking to take the control system further forwards um, and, you know, really demonstrate some of those benefits it can achieve. Yeah. Uh, following on from that, Richard Jones has just asked, do you think there is a, I think you may have touched upon it in your answer, but do you think there's a reason that your product hasn't, why, oh, do you, have a view of why your product hasn't been adop adopted yet? Um, lots of lot, lots of reasons. Co um, COVID being one of the one of the significant challenges, we have. We, I we, 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 are, we, we, we are due to have meetings with quite a few people um, that have been put off and off because of the the impact on normal operations. It was about a year ago that we were doing demonstrations to um, to the rail industry. And we got a lot of very positive feedback from that and, and that opened up some opportunities, but we haven't yet um, converted some of those opportunities into meetings. We've got people saying we'd like to go further, but um, it's just been a very difficult year. Um, so no, I don't know. We, 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 we've we still got more work to do, some more proving to do to make people even more confident. But yeah, um, okay. that's, that's all part of the fun. No problem there. That one was from. That's another one from uh, Richard Jones again. And uh, uh, Julian, uh, a question here from James Harkins, directed at you. Um, I must confess this isn't something that I'm very familiar with personally, so I, I hope I'm asking this right. But um, is there a problem with grooving, such as we have with guided busways? I imagine this is on when you're using your pods in a sort of guiding environment, like on Heathrow. Uh, what that is, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if you've come across it. Yeah, um, yeah. So over a period of time, such as sort of eight, nine years, there is uh, there is a problem of grooving, um, but that's no different from any other road that's currently out there. Um, I guess the an answer to that is, what what do you do about it? Um, is, there's a number of ways. One is to obviously just resurface some of the areas, which you know most of the roads do currently. Um, the other is to use a different um, offset wheel to try and spread the load over a wider area. Um, so yeah, there's a number of different ways to do it really. Um, but obviously with, with new technology coming through on uh, tyres, uh, I think that's going to certainly help to uh, mitigate the grooving effect. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've exhausted all the questions that have been asked unless anyone wants to put a last minute one in. 
uh, or if the panel have any questions for their fellow members. Uh, I know sometimes people do have them and don't get the opportunity. Does anyone on the panel have a question for one of you other panelists? Just to make sure. No, everyone, you all seem to be happy. Oh, jolly good. Um, I think there are, I know this beat you've been answering, there are a lot more questions that have been in. And, but, and first of all, can I thank you all for uh, really keeping up to date with answering the questions as they've come in. You've uh, made this ses session quite easy for me. And uh, But I'm sure actually there are quite a few people who uh, would probably like to uh, discuss some of these a bit more with you um, in more detail. So I'd like to recommend, um, Mildred, I'm glad you've put that in the chat. I was just about what I was going to recommend, that we maybe move this over to the Zoom call where we can have a much more open forum and people can uh, move over there. Uh, what I would uh, first before I do that, can I just thank all the panelists for their presentations? All very insightful, all very interesting, and thank you for the Q and A session. So you'll have to imagine yourselves getting a virtual round of applause from everyone. Um, if I could ask uh, someone to put the uh, the open the Zoom room and put the, the link back in the chat, could you do, uh, Milda? Could you possibly do that, or uh, Sam? I'll just wait and see if we've got that in there. I have just opened the uh, Zoom room. So you, you can you can go. You can also find the link if you don't see it in the chat on your um, reminder email that went straight That's from true. the GoTo webinar. It is uh, indeed. So you yeah. can find it there, and I'll just post it back again to the chat. And I can see Brilliant. some people are arriving. Brilliant. Well, I will uh, open up as well on Zoom, and then I, after that, I will close the uh, uh, this. Uh, if the panelists want to make their way over, please feel free. Um, I will uh, just uh, make uh, open up as well, and then I will close close the. Uh... Mel, did you want to close the meeting down, or do you want me to? Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, if you can close it, uh, just give it five minutes or so. Um, let people to move on. Okay, I will do that in five minutes. Then, thank you very much again to the uh, to our fabulous panel, and look forward to seeing everyone over on uh, on Zoom in a in a few moments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. and <laughs> getting getting everyone in. Okay, so whoever joined the Zoom meeting, don't forget to leave the go to webinar. <laughs>